think we are looking at the whole uh, rental housing ecosystem. I think there are five key drivers that uh, we'll be looking at in our presentation. Uh, number one is, uh, I think we need to identify the target group. Uh, you know, the target group can range anywhere between, uh, for India, you know, migrants. Number two, how do we attract private sector investment into rental housing? What kind of ROI can we guarantee? Number three, how do we engage the government in a meaningful way? Because we have to secure land. We have to tap into all the incentives that is available for rental housing. And above all, I think there are also some subsidies, uh, you know, that is being offered uh, by the government. So that's number two, three. Number four is the whole issue of viability. When you bring in private sector, uh, when we talk about PPP model, you know, so we need to address the whole issue of viability from a from a business standpoint. What is the what is the business model are we looking at? What kind of operational model are we looking at? And the last one, of course is how do we ensure scale and sustainability? By 2030, two thirds of the population will live in urban areas. And it is estimated in India, uh, in terms of uh, the deficit, housing deficit, it, it could be anywhere in the region of 38 to 40 million household units deficit that you will see in urban areas by 2030. So that's the context. And uh, so uh, so the, the, the subject for our, the first two case studies that we are going to be looking at would be uh, uh, looking at international and national experience. What are the lessons learned? What are the best practices in public provision of affordable rental housing stock through greenfield investment? I think that's going to be, uh, uh, you know, the, the subject uh, for our case studies. Uh, so from now till, uh, uh, you know, 445, we'll be looking at two, two case studies. And the way we want to structure is uh, we will have the case studies first, and then um, we will open the floor uh, for uh, question and answer. Okay, so let me uh, introduce our uh, first speaker, uh, Paul Jackson. Uh, Paul is the CEO of Trust for Urban Housing Finance uh, from South Africa. Uh, Paul holds a BSc in Agriculture uh, and he has an economics degree from the University of Natal. And he also has a BS, uh, BSc Honours in Agriculture Economics from the University of uh, Pretoria. Uh, Paul has been, uh, you know, uh, the, the CEO of, uh, of uh, Trust for Urban Housing Finance since the inception in 2003 and has been involved in the development finance uh, since 1987. Uh, so he has been involved since the inception, he's got a lot of experience and the Trust for Urban Housing Finance has been doing extensive work in the urban space, housing, housing space in South Africa. And uh, so without further ado, uh, let's uh, travel to South Africa and I would request uh, Paul Jackson uh, to present the first case study from uh, Trust for Urban Housing Finance. So over to Paul Jackson. Thanks, Rajan. Uh, is Paul here? Uh, Lara, do you see Paul? Yen, do you have any update? Yen. Go to the, the second case study and then come back. Or, or to be very... Yeah, I was just uh, wanting to check with Ian before we do that. Looks, looks like Ian's yeah. um, uh, microphone is kind of not there. I mean, it's not showing. So maybe our oh. microphone is not working. Yeah, we have received uh, Paul's uh, presentation. So I'll just uh, uh, ask him to join. Why don't we go into the next case study till then? Okay. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Thanks, Thanks, Raj. Sir. Yeah, so the, it's a, let's move to the second case study and then uh, one, once Paul is online, you know, we will uh, uh, so travel with me back to uh, back to India. Of course, we go to Paris. So the case, second case study is about how to develop formal urban rental markets in India. Uh, these are learnings from uh, Tamil Nadu in India. 
and uh, we have two uh, excellent, eminent uh, presenters. Uh, we have Claude, she's a housing economist uh, from France, and we have our own uh, Anirita Mukherjee, senior researcher for Center for Policy Research. Um, let me uh, briefly introduce our, uh, our presenters. Um, Mr. Claudie is a, is a consultant with over 35 years of experience in housing sector, and he's the co-founder of the website, uh, I don't know how to uh, pronounce this. <laughs> yeah, politicoromint.com. He was in charge of housing at the French Institute of Statistics, and, uh, and then he joined the World Bank as senior housing finance specialist. Um, so I, I invite uh, Mr. Claude uh, to take the floor and let me also introduce uh, Anidita Mukherjee, uh, who's our uh, senior researcher from Center for Policy Research. Uh, Anidita Mukherjee is a center, is a senior researcher at the Center for Policy Research, working with scaling city institutions for India, uh, focused on water and sanitation initiatives. Spanning almost 15 years of her career, she has worked with different sector partners, civil society organization, and other bilateral and multilateral agencies, uh, such as FPDO. As it's been part of design, formulation, implementation of large scale national housing program and various housing policies. So I request uh, uh, Claude and uh, Anudita to take the floor. And uh, so over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rajan. And uh, unfortunately, Claude is going to join around 4.30. He had some last minute uh, engagement. So how we will do our presentation and that will allow me to... Um, Paul has joined. Paul, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you well. For some reason, I was on a I had a Teams invite in my calendar. My apologies. <laughs> no problem. So, Paul, uh, Dr. Rajan had introduced you for the first presentation. Uh, yeah. You want to go ahead for, with the first presentation, then I can come in. Okay. Dr. Rajan, is that fine with you? Absolutely. Uh, Paul, uh, welcome <laughs> to the, the lab, the you know, third lab where we're looking at the private sector investment in rental housing. And I did introduce you. So, uh, so over to you. Thank you. I'm just um, finding my presentation here. Um, give me one minute. Um, it is here. So I need to just go to the share screen. Um, um, hang on a minute, please. No problem. Hopefully you can see that presentation. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and um, I'll try and keep within um, um, 10 minutes. It'll be quite difficult. Um, but I do intend to try and chair, please uh, um, um, hurry me along. Um, I'm Paul Jackson and Lutanda, uh, Lusanda Nechitenze is my colleague. We will be presenting a small company called Tough in South Africa. Um, essentially, we've been around for 17 years, and this basically shows the growth of our loan book over those uh, 17 years. In the, uh, I'd just like to stop on this slide for a minute and say that we are a residential commercial property finance provider. So in other words, we don't do home loans, individuals buying houses or, or flats for uh, apartments for themselves. And we don't do um, um, microfinance. We're a mortgage financing company that funds against the cash flows generated by the building. And we achieve com commercially competitive returns for our shareholders. We uh, compare ourselves with other financial services and in, uh, institutions. But at the same time, we make a difference. In other words, development impact. I'll leave uh, um, 
the rest of the slide just for you to read. This is an important slide because we depart from the, the um, point that housing is not a social good, but an economic good. It, it's a real driver of economic prosperity. And it's part of the real economy promoting local economic development. And as a result, investments in housing should be demand led. We believe it's an economic asset because it stimulates e economic growth through urban densification, smart cities. It promotes um, SME development. And while I'm on that point, um, we, we are not a housing financing we're a house, we're an SME financing company, property entrepreneur financing company with a housing outcome. And um, we contribute to sustainable development through access to local economies, amenity, and infrastructure. And the last is that our investments have a positive impact on um, um, local eco economic, uh, local government um, coffers. So the do good part of it. So we're in, we're a good business. We give. Uh, competitive returns, and we do good in that we promote entrepreneurial growth, we promote local economic development, job creation and skills development, urban regeneration and, and densification, fiscal impact, and in South Africa, the very important critical issue of urban land reform. We are a conventional financial services company. Um, we um, we follow a um, standard best practice loan origination process, uh, loan origination appraisal, or as Americans would call it, underwriting process, uh, closing and servicing. Uh, this is supported by a, 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 an end-to-end -end IT system. It has very defined governance and credit procedures. The important point is that for a project to get approved at Tough, and I won't go through the detail of of each component, it has to be commercially viable and the borrower character assessment being a hybrid, hybrid assessment between credit history and, um, and a series of interviews and reference checking must pass muster. Tough developed back in 2003 and initially we had early support from from local DFIs. Um, and we built a mortgage track record, which is about five years plus to even start getting the capital markets in, involved. Um, we had a number of impact investors, in fact, before the five years was up, but, but as we went further down our, our lending, we started to get impact investors and some of the commercial banks. Um, and then in 2012, we had strategic shareholders that came in from um, various companies looking for both impact and hard returns. And increasingly, we've moved to listed debt, to borrowing money at market rates from the capital markets. I do want to emphasize Tufts founding objective was it should not be uh, reliant on concessional finance because that would hamper our growth over time. The regulatory framework, I was particularly asked to, to deal with that. There was no special regulation for TUF in, um, in South Africa. We merely complied with the, the regulations, particularly around the National Credit Act. We, um, we are not part of the Banks Act or the Financial Services Act, um, but obviously are required for the sort of know your client KYC legislation the Companies Act, and then as a debt issuer, um, quite a lot of um, oversight from the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. The emphasis was no particular regulatory relaxation for us. We merely um, homed in on, on a particular market. Here's one of the buildings that uh, one of our clients, our merging clients funded. This was an old light industrial building, and he converted it to... Um, um, residential apartments. This is in the township area. So you can imagine South African cities has a sort of more 
formal urban dense kind of area around the city centers. Um, many of our city centers that have gone into a traditional uh, urban decline. And then we have townships, um, particularly where back in the apartheid areas, um, um, people of color was, were required to live. Areas have become vibrant. Uh, they're quite close to the cities as the cities have expanded. And uh, this is one of our entrepreneurs in her, in her best uh, outfit with a house that she'd bought in that area and demolished and, and built um, there. And then this is just a standard refurbishment down in Cape Town. Um, we do have a, a ancillary fund called the Intertuga Equity Fund for urban land reform purposes to assist entrepreneurs who borrow senior debt at normal commercial rates at normal commercial conditions and the Intertugo Equity Fund assists them in dealing with their deposit requirements. I do want to make two or three extremely important points. The first is the belief in the ordinary person and the power of local knowledge. Um, and these are all examples of entrepreneurs of ours that we financed. But in South African cities, there's a phenomenon underway where many small entrepreneurs like the ones you see here and many, many others are starting to use their local knowledge, use their access to resources and use their access to land to start developing and densifying our cities. Um, it's been underway for a number of years and it's gaining momentum. Um, and it's driven by the power of local knowledge. So Tufts business is basically based on the belief that the housing is firstly demand led and secondly, best provided by uh, many small entrepreneurs who live and work in the areas they're developing. South Africa has a major urban sprawl problem. Um, initially, housing was a, a budget item and South Africa, came, uh, after apartheid, built 4 million homes, which for a country our size is, a, is an enormous achievement. But we changed it more to habitats. The policy changed more to ha habitats and human settlements. And it really was uh, an important shift because urban densification um, is required for social and economic action. Uh, poverty is entrenched if people are on the uh, periphery and there's a positive fiscal impact concerning a densification. I'm um, pushed for time, so I'm gonna leave that there. But to say that in addition to, to large mega projects, one of the ways or a significant way of sol solving our housing problem and promoting economic growth and development in this in this area is to go with the concept of massive small, uh, to do 200 or 200,000 20 unit projects per annum is what we are, 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 are talking about this. It's usually uh, in city, it will usually involve densification and the government's role is to provide an enabling environment. Um, and so, we create massive impact, is, is what we say at Tough, through many small changes um, to the cities we operate in. So what's the role of the public sector? Um, to focus on its core responsibilities, bylaw enforcement, um, building standards enforcement, those kind of things, but then to get out of the way. Uh, in South Africa, we have a phenomenon that government is slow and cumbersome and often becomes a problem in the rapid development that we need to see in our cities, but they have a critical role in these kind of things and by law enforcement. So our largest risk to development in the South African concept is dysfunctional local government. Um, rising administrative costs, uh, taxation costs, which are anti-investment, um, poor by law enforcement, um, and um, this leads to capital raising constraints and lack of empowerment. If I can just stop on this point to make one other point. TUF has been successful by South African standards because it's had patient capital. Initially from DFIs in the form of equity capital, 
but later on through investors who have received commercially very good returns, but have not been in and out for, for two years, but have taken the sort of five to 10 year view. The second is, is that in order to be sustainable and replicable, we have tried to avoid being dependent or even um, seeking concessionary finance. We seek normal commercial finance that we can borrow off the capital markets, lend in a commercially sustainable and profitable way and create a difference at the same time. And I think I went a little bit over my time, but that's, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Rajan. Rajan, I think you're on mute. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Paul, for an excellent presentation. Uh, for a quick uh, takeaway from your presentation, uh, we talk about disengagement of the government. So we don't need to engage the government. Don't look at subsidy at this point. You, you know, your business model is very tight. You're tapping it to money from the capital market. Uh, you know, local knowledge is critical. Uh, you know, it's demand debt, uh, you know, and, uh, and of course, it's economic good. You know, of course, you have a social uh, agenda, but I think the focus is more on economic uh, good. And, and, and yours is a mortgage finance company. So, Paul, what we'll do is we'll take, all, take, take up questions after the second uh, presentation. And um, so we'll come back to you later. Uh, That's absolutely fine. I'll mute in between. Thank you. Uh, now over to uh, Anandita. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Rajan. So our session, uh, this session is uh, jointly done with Claude Tafa. Uh, Claude will join in about five minutes or so. We have divided this session between us. Uh, I'll take you through the rental housing market presentation in India, uh, while Claude will take us through uh, a few critical highlights from the France, uh, the model of private sector in France. So uh, not for the wasting time, I'll start. Uh, my screen is big enough to uh, go like this. Can I operate it like this? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Rajan, uh, for your kind words. So India has been, uh, you know, uh, about 22 million people lived in rented accommodation in 2011 uh, in India. And also into the recent national sample survey uh, that has come out projects this number to be 30 million in, as per 2019. So there has been a significant proportion of people who have been lived, living in rental housing. However, Indian policies and programs have remained skewed towards increasing home ownership, particularly among the urban poor. However, as you can see that many, uh, there has been a steady increase in the proportion of renting among the urban poor, the bottom two quintiles uh, in the consumption quintile, the bottom two, shows a steady increase in resorting to renting. Now, the ongoing pandemic has also spotlighted the extent of urban mobility, which heightens the need to focus on rental housing as a solution for a significant proportion of urban. While during the lockdown, central government issued waivers, uh, directives to have rent waivers for uh, specifically urban poor renters, and renter in general, inadequate implementation led to mass exodus of urban workers that we have seen who actually walk, walked long distances on foot. So even if they would have, you know, stayed back as in the rental accommodation, I wanted to highlight that uh, two of the most critical failures against the pandemic, that's the social distancing and maintaining hygiene through frequent hand washing must have been very difficult. As you can see, more than 60% of the renters are actually depending on shared services, much higher than the owners. And also the congestion is more rampant among renters. So against this background, Government of India uh, came up as a reaction to this uh, with a new scheme called re affordable rental housing complexes and within which they 
are intending to foster private participation in delivering rental housing at scale. However, as we all know, there remains a number of obstacles and perceived risks in renting. The quite common cultural bias, which cuts across various countries, low gross rate of return, lack of financial incentives, and perceived legal hindrances for reposition remains big challenges. As a result, most of the landlords prefer to keep their houses vacant, and the number is quite high in case of India. It's 11 million as per 2011 uh, census that was carried out. If we, if we try and see this data a little more disaggregated, what we see that about eight states accounts for 75% of renting that happens in India. And uh, Tamil Nadu accounts for the highest share of these rented households, which at about 17%. As part of a World Bank study, which is under review uh, and submitted as a draft to the bank, uh, we took a deep dive uh, to see the rental market that's currently there in, in Tamil Nadu. So uh, not so surprisingly, Tamil Nadu is also one of the forerunners in, in, in uh, passing the new tenancy law, which is uh, formulated in line with the national law that, ha that is still under a draft stage. And it, barring, it has many forward-looking provisions. But it has one critical premise on which this law has been formulated is that all landlords and tenants agrees to enter into a legally binding contract and, um, and that all such contracts will get registered with the rent authority. However, registration remains a problematic area as it can be seen, avoid, it can be avoided legally if entered into a 11 month contract unregistered contracts, which accounts for about 80% at the moment, will remain outside the purview of this new law. Further, rent authorities are not even empowered to evict and repossess in case of dispute. It still goes back to the rent court. Rental yields are low, I told you earlier also, but the existing tax laws and the costly finances adds to the problem. The high cost of registration and stamp duties, prop property tax accounting for six to 12% of the lease value deters many households to put their properties on rent. Further, due to the fixed standard deduction rates, there is limited incentives to invest in large maintenance. The draft paper also advocates for a lower mortgage interest rates to improve financing viability for the rental, uh, rental housing supply. So all this put together kind of points out uh, to the low, low income, low rental yield as, and rate of return, which lags far behind from the rate of returns that a saving bank account is able to offer. Further, savings accounts are much less risky. It's almost no risk with more liquidity. The risk adjusted rental returns are often negative. The house owners, mostly small and informal landlords, end up renting to their kith and kin without a written agreement or leave their units vacant. So how, how can we solve this problem or at least attempt towards building a robust market? The first would be to minimize obstacles that reduce efficiency in the rental market. Paul has said that the government should be out of the picture. The, the, the broad frameworks of legal frameworks, uh, if they are in place, planning frameworks are in place, that should be enough for the market to work. Uh, we need to also acknowledge the diversity among the tenants. All tenants don't, do not require same uh, administration of the policy. Standardized lease agreements can reduce a lot of cost burden on the tenants. Tax incentives and grants for renovation will be able to address significant, uh, for, uh, significantly in releasing additional rent into the market. Apologies for that. This has to also uh, seems to be more effective if it, is, if it is coupled by financial incentives. Policy or to account, the national urban rental housing policy, which remains in a draft forms, accounts for market segmentation, but a little uh, nuance segmentation will help. 
given the social renting requirements are quite high in case of India. Other than that, one of the major reason for this gap that remains is also data. The last detailed survey was a national sample survey in 2007-8 that happened for migrants and renters. So there is a huge data gap and this needs to be built in through adequate research. Between, to, to bridge the gap between the landlords and the tenants, uh, IT-based solutions, as um, Paul was mentioning, could solve a lot of lot of problem that India is currently facing. Thank you, thank you so much, Rajan, for this opportunity. Thanks a lot, Rajita, uh, for a great presentation. Uh, has uh, Claudia joined us? Oh, yes. Yes. Claudia is here. Yeah. So, Claudia, over to you. Arindita has touched on the case study from uh, Tamil Nadu. Uh, I'm sure you're going to add your bit. Uh. Uh, yeah, good evening. Sorry, the, the sound is not very good. I couldn't hear your question. Uh, no, Claude, I, uh, Raj, uh, Claude uh, Rajan is requesting you to share the France presentation. Oh, yes, of course. I first try to share my screen. Yes. Is it is it okay? Yes. Uh, yes, yes. We can see that. Yeah. Thank you. So why uh, why speak about France and um, not only because I am French, but because as uh, surprisingly we'll see some uh, some similarities between the situation in uh, maybe not India but at least Tamil Nadu because I cannot pretend that I know uh, every Indian state uh, and and uh, what happened uh, in the in the private rental sector in France and uh, and what we tried, uh, the authorities tried to do to, to improve things. So uh, I start, I think we have limited time, so I'll go rapidly uh, on an overview of the uh, French housing stock and production and the housing policy. First, I mentioned the parallels between France and Tamil Nadu. First, we have the same population, more or less, right? And well, for the rest, of course, it's France is very urban. We have small average household size because we have a old population. And we built, uh, you see the, it's the, the, yellow, uh, the yellow graph. We built about four, around 400,000 units, housing units per year, which more or less correspond to our housing needs. So everything would be nice. Uh, the problem is that, of course, we have a high, high density, high pressure areas like Paris region, where, of course, it's much more difficult to build, and this is where the, most of the problem lies. Uh, we have a rather balanced tenure distribution, uh, relatively low uh, ownership rate, and a large uh, social rented sector, and also a rather large um, private rented sector. Compared to England, for example, they have more uh, ownership, similar ratio of uh, social rental, and they have less private rental than, than we have. Uh, the rental stock, uh, as you can see on the right side, uh, the blue, the blue is the in the private. You see that the private has been decreasing until the mid 80s and then coming up again. And the red one, which is a social one, kept increasing, uh, even, even if many people, of course, think it's not enough, because this is where they, uh, the poorest family are hosted. So how did we uh, try to move? Move this down. Yes. <clears throat> so, as you can see, the housing policy has uh, three legs home ownership, social rental, and private rental. Uh, this support, this uh, rather general and generous support, has a cost, which is 1.7% of GDP per year. This is rather high. You can see on the, uh, on the right that it's uh, it's also rather balanced between the, the three, three tenure, 
which are uh, and that private rental has a large part of the support. Uh, this support, as uh, we will see, is mostly under the form of uh, housing allowances, which are for all uh, poor uh, tenants, even in the social and in the private stock. And there is a, an important uh, tax part for tax credit, which is mostly for the private rental sector. We can be generous with, uh, with subsidies because uh, we have a high level of taxation and also a high level of, of uh, budget deficit, which of course terribly increased after the, the pandemic crisis. Uh, I can go rapidly over tenants and landlord characteristics because they are quite expected. Uh, the tenants are mostly young, not rich, have a small, small size, but they pay a lot uh, for their housing compared to their, to their income. And last but not least, there is, it's a very mobile population. Uh, half of them has moved in in the last four years and the mobility rate is about close to 20%. Uh, this is probably the main reason for why the state, the government encourages production of uh, private units. It's to allow, to facilitate young uh, families, young individuals and young couples mobility for, uh, <clears throat> uh, for, job, for reasons legally linked to, to, to their job. The landlords, the main characteristic is that they are almost all individuals. Uh, we have uh, a few insurance companies. They used to have a large stock in the 60s and 70s, but they all, all went out. We have no pension funds and we have some REITs. The, the acronyms that you can see, SCPI and SIIC are two different forms of French REITs. But as uh, most REITs, they are most invested in uh, commercial property and very little in housing, even though they can benefit from the, the tax incentives which are uh, for individuals. Uh, so these individual landlords are uh, in majority rather old, not all retired, but above, above 50. And of course, in the upper quartile of income distribution. As uh, Anindita um, told us, regulation of tenant landlord relationship is key to, to maintain um, a, large, a large enough private rental sector. Uh, by chance, the, our background has been rather stable in the last about 20 years. The rental agreement has been written form. It must be three year minimum when uh, the uh, the owner is an individual. The landlord may not easily terminate the lease. Uh, there are limited cases when he can do this. And usually it's only at the end of the three year lease. To terminate the lease before the expiration of the lease, um, the landlord must have been uh, must have defaulted in a, in, a, in a serious way. On the contrary, uh, the tenant is more or less free to terminate the lease with uh, just a one or three month notice. Uh, a French oddity, I think it's rather uh, special, is that no eviction is permitted during winter time from November to March, because unlike India, you know, France is rather cold uh, at, this, uh, at this time of the year. Uh, this is uh, less in balance that it had been in the past, but it's still in favor of tenants. And uh, on top of that, when there is a case, uh, the justice most often uh, is in favor of the tenant because it's supposed to be the poor while the, the landlord is supposed to be the rich. It is caricatural, but of course, this is what happens uh, many times. Uh, the, another issue is that even when the uh, the justice gives reason to the landlord, uh, the local authorities will be quite reluctant to evict families. So that will take very long time and sometimes will never happen. Another big issue in the regulation is the rent setting. 
I have no time to, to, to show that in detail, but the government has uh, desperately been trying to limit rent increases because in spite of the, the increase of this stock, it's still not enough for compared to the demand in large cities. So we have now a rather complicated system, which says that uh, the principle is that the first contract is more or less free, at least for newly built uh, uh, units. Um, upon renewal of the contracts, there is a limited possibility to increase rents, at least when it's proved to be overvalued, uh, some undervalued, of course. And during the lease, the rent is pegged to an index, which is more or less the consumer price index. You see that there are two columns because recently we have introduced a, a way that we call the German way to try to, to tie the new rents, not to the flow of, uh, not to market rents, but to stock rents, which obviously are much lower. This is more or less a return to uh, a kind of a, something between a soft and a hard rent control, uh, which is uh, criticized by uh, even by the government, but which has been put in place by some socialist I must say, municipalities, including Paris. Um, taxation, I will not describe in, in detail. Uh, we are, as everybody knows, we are heavily taxed. If you just, we have of course rental income tax, we have property tax, and off the top of that, we have a wealth tax, which is now focused only on real estate property. So if you add up all this, of course, there are people who do not pay taxes, but they are rare among, uh, among rental landlords. Uh, I made a funny calculation. If you pay the maximum, the maximum tax rate for uh, rental income is about a little more than 50%. But if you are rich and lucky enough to pay the property wealth tax, you may reach 90%. Of course, this concerns very few people. It's just um, just to give an idea of uh, how the pressure can be if you are if you are rich enough. Of course, you also have capital gain tax at a rather high level, which uh, is reduced after five years, but totally disappears only after thirty years. You have to be very patient, uh, and we have a tax on vacant dwellings to try to incite people not to keep uh, vacant property without occupants, which after all is not a stupid strategy because, uh, because of the high prices and uh, the, 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 the gross rental income is something, let's say about 4%, comes down to 3% after taking accounts of the different costs and goes down to something between one and a half and 2% taking into account taxation. So people are more, uh, of course, they have, they have leverage effect when they resort to credit because we have also very low uh, interest rates. But most investors are uh, driven by capital gain expectations because prices in, a, in the Paris area have been uh, most of the time increasing, increasing rather fast. Um, well, when you are in a country where taxes are so high, you can be very sensitive to tax incentives. This is why this, is, uh, this instrument has been used uh, by the authorities to, to try to support the, the production of new, uh, of new rental houses. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> too sorry. late. You have a minute to wrap up, Claude, I'm sorry. I'm uh, coming very rapidly <laughs> because the rationale, the rationale I can be very short because I already mentioned it, to encourage young people mobility the other reason is that the institutional investors had uh, more or less disappeared because of uh, the unbalanced relationship, the return, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we introduce uh, different schemes. Uh, the one which is in uh, actually uh, existing allows to deduct about 20% of the price uh, the purchase price of the unit spread over the duration of the of the time when it has to be rented. You get 21% if you commit yourself to rent it uh, during 20 years, 
with a maximum rent, which is 20% on the market, and the maximum income for, for the tenants. So this has proved very, uh, oh, I came back. This proved very efficient to increase the, <clears throat> to increase the, the, the number of units. Uh, it became very important for developers because it's approximately half of the production of uh, developers. And a few drawbacks, of course, that uh, as it's not for home ownership, but mostly for rental, there are some issues about, about qualities and prices. Uh, and also a perfect effect about the location because the rate limit, of course, is not set by district. It's made by large zones. So the developers find the right zone to, to invest and it's not exactly when the, the needs are the, the most important. Anyway, you should just keep in mind that these tax incentives, because taxation usually is very high, had been very efficient to uh, incentivize private investors into the rental uh, housing. Whew, thank you, not too late. Yeah, thank you, Claude, uh, for a very uh, insightful presentation. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to sum up the two presentations. I, I've written three similarities uh, between what uh, Claude and, and the uh, presenter. Number one is regulation is critical, you know, both in the case of Tamil Nadu case study and the France case study. Number two is that there is a big chunk of social renting. Uh, we call it socialized housing or social renting. Uh, that's number two. Number three is that what Anurita shared was in terms of IRR, it's negative. That's because of some incentives, regulations, etc. The fourth one is in terms of the tax in India, it's 30%. You pay tax on rental income. Whereas in the case of France, it's 36.20%. Uh, so, so, so we have uh, about nine minutes uh, before we have the, the, the plenary session. So we, we can take three questions. Uh, one uh, for, uh, for Peter, uh, and then one each for Claude and Anita. So sorry, Paul. <laughs> so let's take the first question. Uh, Lara, do you have the question from the chat box? Yeah, so uh, that's a question to... Um, uh, to Paul, is it? Or uh, to, yeah, Paul. To, to Mr. Paul Jackson. Uh, the Sophia Joseph from Habitat asks uh, about how did you really manage the, social, the entrepreneurs who have come into rental housing uh, and uh, what is the kind of uh, uh, support... Uh, that uh, the government can provide because mostly uh, these uh, facilities, they kind of uh, slack even though when they're run by the government. So how has uh, PUHF group, and maybe he can bring in Uma Stanley here as to what is the experience on uh, really uh, enabling the uh, entrepreneurs into rental housing? Yeah. Paul Jackson. Um, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, we have, we tend to avoid um, interacting with government on things like that. Uh, we have a substantial program of support that we run ourselves at our cost. Um, and it's broken down into three components. One is a induction program, which basically spells out in quite a lot of detail the obligations of entering into this financing contract. The second is we have the tough, and please do call us tough, um, which is acronym TUHF, but we like to be called TUF. Um, the TUF program for property entrepreneurs, which is an accredited program through one of our major universities here. It's an online program with um, people coming into the office looking at the questions of being an entrepreneur, the investment, et cetera, et cetera. And the last, and, and I do want to emphasize probably the most important is a mentorship program. And here we've got entrepreneurs of similar sizes, similar backgrounds, similar cultural language and other experiences um, who mentor other newcomers because they can see the world through that perspective. This is, we have a similar program in the Umastandi um, um, developments, um, you know, being the more township and, and smaller based. I'm, I forgot to say our average loan size 
in Tough Limited, our conventional business is running at about 8 million rand. Um, whereas the average loan side for our Umastandi um, developments is under a million. So it's a, it's a very strong on average. I mean, we have uh, projects in, in Tough Limited that are around that level as well. But on average, the, they tend to be smaller projects. So we have a very strong level of support. The only caution that we give is that you shouldn't, you should give support to the line where the responsibility for the loan and the contract and the performance of the project remains very much with the entrepreneur, the SME, and that it's not by somehow um, uh, taken over by tough. Um, this is a support to the entrepreneur uh, at, at its most basic. Um, I'll leave it there. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Let's uh, take the second question, um, Baran. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Paul, there are more questions about uh, income level of uh, tough finance projects and the rate of return uh, to tough rental housing projects. If you want to take that in a minute, and then I'll go to Claude. Um, yeah, the uh, I was interested in in uh, the, the the presentation by Nindita um, in in respect of returns. Investment in rental housing is profitable in in South Africa. Um, we basically fund rental. Our clients fund rentals from about fifteen hundred rand, hundred US dollars per month, I guess. Um, through to 5,000 Rand. And if you use the exchange rate of 15 Rand to the dollar, um, you get an idea. So ours is for poor and moderate income earners, but not for um, the very poor. They fall outside that sort of commercial side that we finance. Um, the rate of return is usually an initial yield of about... 12%. In other words, if you take your project rental income, less your project costs, and divide that by the total investment, um, you are getting about a rental yield of 12%. Our inflation currently runs, um, well, it's a bit lower now due to COVID, but on average runs within a band between 4 and 6%. Um, right. I can assure you that the return is many times the savings rate. I think that's the important. Uh, it's not clear how you could have a risk-free rate and you would invest in a risky project at the same as at the same rate as as a risk-free rate. So the returns are sufficient to justify the risk that the SME is 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 uh, taking. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Paul. Uh, in the interest of time, I do uh, see Anindita has answered the questions that have been addressed to her. There is one question to Claude, and I uh, may request Claude to please briefly uh, respond to this question, and then we will move into our keynote uh, speaker who has already joined us, Dr. Hiranandani. Uh, so to Claude, what are the key incentives being given to private sector for private-led public rental housing projects? And uh, is private corporate sector involved in France? Well, that's a tough question and it's difficult to answer in length. That's about an hour. Uh, there, private public, in terms of what we call social housing, uh, is, I couldn't say, meaningless. There is no public uh, housing in France. We have registered social landlords, which are the same as in England. We have the equivalent of council housing, which is local uh, public enterprises, and we have non-profit sector, just like the housing association. And we have also um, some what we call mixed economy, uh, PPPs, between private and public. So this, this so, uh, what we call the social sector has specific rules concerning, uh, concerning incentives, totally different from the private. Uh, they consist in tax subsidies, uh, in uh, very low 
uh, interest rate loans, which are financed through uh, saving uh, through saving booklets, which exist in several countries, but they they are transformed into long term uh, cheap loans. And of course, on top of that, uh, we have uh, we have housing allowance for tenants in, in both sectors. Uh, when you are asking if private corporate sector is involved, uh, yes, we have a specific taxation <laughs> again. Uh, for enterprises who were supposed to pay 1% of the salaries to help to contribute financing the social housing stock. It's now less than, than 1%, but it still exists. And they also, um, these 1%, they also are directly in, uh, invested in, the, in social housing. Thank you, Claude. Thank you here. so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to, um, Rajan, would you please introduce uh, our keynote speaker? And I see two hands raised. I'd uh, please request Dr. Suresh and Mr. Isaac to type your questions in the Q&A handle or in the chat, please. Over to Rajan. Thank you, Thank you Claude. Thank you, Anand. Yeah, you know, on behalf of the policy uh, lab group, I want to extend uh, a heartfelt thanks and appreciation to Paul. Uh, to Anandita and uh, Cody. So let's give them a great round of applause. Thank you, gentlemen. So we move to the, the, the second section uh, of uh, today's uh, deliberation as a keynote address. So it's my pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Dr. Daranjan Hiranandani. He's a founder and chairman of the Hiranandani Group of Companies. He's currently the president of Naratko and uh, he's also an active member of Habitat India's advisory committee. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Hiranandani started his career as a chartered accountant and, uh, and he has built many things. He has built uh, many people's lives. He has built many institutions. He has built many policies and programs. And uh, one of the things he has built is also a hospital and, uh, and he calls this as a building of passion. So he's a great builder <laughs> and he needs no interaction. And uh, so, uh, Dr. Hiranandani, thank you so much for taking time to join us uh, for this uh, lab three, uh, policy lab uh, number three, where we are looking at private sector investment in rental housing. So, without uh, much ado, uh, I want to welcome you, and I want uh, you know the floor is yours uh, to, to present the keynote address for us. So, over to Dr. Hiranandani. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rajan Samuel, for the very kind introduction that you have done. And thank you very much for the invite to, to this uh, eminent group of people to which I am addressing today. It's my pleasure and privilege too. Uh, the Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, has been in the last five years very, very, very aggressive in providing affordable housing for all in the country. The target has been uh, to construct developed 12 million houses. All these 12 million houses have been uh, worked out in terms of planning, in terms of location, in terms of uh, approvals, in terms of financing, and these projects are already off the ground. So out of uh, 11 million houses, Already 3.6 million houses have now been complete. Uh, 8.2 million houses are now under construction in terms of being above the ground. And these are spread over all parts of the country. Unfortunately, some of the prominent locations like Delhi, Mumbai, and the regions around large metropolitan areas haven't been able to give enough land where actually the needs have been the highest. And hence, there has been a challenge in terms of this segment of housing for the poorest of the poor. And that continues to be the challenge. However, you must recognize the fact that this deficit, which was calculated, was on the basis that they would make housing for all in terms of ownership. Now, the recognition has taken place. And the prime minister and the housing ministry, uh, Mr. Harpi Puri and others, have now reworked out a second plan. The second plan is affordable rental housing policy. And this also has been announced by the Honorable Prime Minister in July 2020. 
and uh, that is in the midst of this pandemic. One of the instigators of this policy has been the movement of migrant labor. With the, with the pandemic taking place, migrant mobile, uh, labor in millions went back to their hometowns. As you must be aware that uh, the entire Northern Belt provides migrant laborers to come and work in the center, Western and Southern part of India. So states like uh, UP, Madhya Pradesh, Bihar, Jharkhand are the sources of migrant labor while cities uh, like uh, regions like Delhi, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Mumbai region, Karnataka are all the recipients of these migrant labors. So a focus is now being thought of as to how can we do with this uh, 100 million migrant labor. It's a humongous task. However, the prime minister has said, yes, we must take it up. And uh, the policy is now being laid out by which uh, the existing uh, policy, which I asked today, will be changed, will be financed, will be worked through in this. Two or three directions have been taken. Direction number one, land which will be in the government sector will be utilized for this and land in the private sector will be also utilized. The land in the government sector has been is being identified where surplus is lands lying with various departments of the center and states uh, on a voluntary basis uh, would be put up for this housing segment. The second part of it is that there would be adequate incentive in terms of buildable areas, in terms of taxation and others, some of which is expected in the next budget. Some of it has been laid down in terms of the policy, but however, those policy details will have to come into the Income Tax Act in the next budget so that the implementation can take place into this segment. The third part of it, which is interesting, is a pending model rent act law. This model rent act law was put up by the ministry about three years ago. I may be wrong. It could be four years. It could be two and a half years ago. Uh, I, I can't recall the exact time. And they did a model rent act wherein an incentive would be given both to the landlords and the tenants in order to provide adequate returns on the investments made by landlords, especially in the case of newer rentals. And also uh, they, the, the, the persons who have taken the tenements would also get protected during the time of the tenancy. And unless there is some very severe issues the, 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 the landlord would not be able to vacate. Of course, he would be able to vacate if payments are not done. That is the provision of the law. However, we must understand that in the federal structure of India, uh, this policy meant uh, has to be ratified by the states. And uh, since a large majority of states are under the BJP influence, uh, it is expected that most of them will get passed and approved in many parts of the country. Of, however, with the differences which exist today, some of the states obviously are not going to cooperate or may provide for a different law than what has been suggested by the central government or the federal government as is understood by many of the people who are not in India. So long and short of it is, we have a threefold direction. The threefold direction is those in the affordable segment, a policy law is coming up, wherein uh, incentivized basis in terms of tax and others would be provided so that there would be sufficient incentive uh, for a person to give the apartment on rent and not keep it vacated, not keep it vacant. On the second part of it is that both the central and the state governments will now work on the affordable rental housing policy. And these will now provide for various people and sectors, which would include migrant labor, but it would also include street renters. It would look up student housing. And all these aspects of it are also to be considered by the government in terms of the policy note that they have issued. So the idea basically being that the thought process earlier, which the prime minister had initiated was housing for all 
on an ownership basis. Later on, it was realized that this is not really going to be work. It cannot be possible for each and every one to own a house in the country, and there's no need for it either. So the second policy, which has now come out, is more clear in terms of the general situation which exists all over the world. So whether it's America, whether it's France, whether it's uh, China, whether it's uh, Russia, Eastern countries, Western countries, Middle East, all the countries in the world have both these segments which are available, namely ownership housing, B, rental housing. Both these segments are to be taken up into the consideration for this. And now we, it is to be seen how the post-COVID story will pan out both by the states and the central government in order to push the initiatives in terms of both the segments of the housing, one which will be driven by investments from the top end, uh, which is the affordable segment. And the second, driving the affordable rental housing policy, which they call ARHS policy, uh, which is really something which will have to be driven by additional incentives, which are planned, some of which, which have been declared in terms of FSI, et cetera, Others in terms of taxation are still to be announced and those segments are likely to take place. The long and short of it, the story is that the next rollout is taking place in terms of this segment. So housing for humanity must take into consideration to participate in the venture of the prime minister in terms of this segmentation as there are sufficient incentives available in order to take care of this, which I think in the long term will be a very good story for India and also an example to the rest of the world. So thank you very much. I'm ready for any questions, if any. And uh, if there are any issues in terms of this subject uh, or any other subject in relating to housing, I'm quite happy to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hiranandani, for laying out the a kind of a blueprint. You started off with uh, the vision of uh, Prime Minister, how he started the housing for all, and uh, the three fold direction that you spoke about. Uh, one is the affordable, uh, you know, segment. Uh, you know, we can expect some incentive and, <coughs> and tax incentive, so that I think we need to ramp up uh, the deficit that we see in the affordable housing segment. I think the second point that you mentioned is inclusivity. I think that's going to be important when you're talking about state and the center coming together and looking at this, uh, you know, the, the huge demand that exists, uh, you know, including uh, migrant workers. I think that inclusivity approach is something that that uh, we all are looking forward to, uh, you know, so that we can uh, together, you know, address the deficit that exists in urban uh, areas. And the third one that you spoke about is the the ownership housing versus the rental housing. And uh, I think with the policy, as they uh, you know, roll out uh, the affordable rental housing policies, the uh, incentives and the operational dynamics, I I'm sure that uh, you know, it's going to uh, provide clarity uh, for all of us in this space, especially for Habitat, uh, so that uh, you know, we can join hands with the government and also bring in the private sector. I think that is where uh, we would like to see scale and, uh, you know, and the sustainability of uh, all that we do uh, in, in addressing the housing deficit in our country. So Dr. Hiranani, again, thank you so much uh, for uh, sharing your wisdom and uh, sharing your time with us. And uh, I don't know whether we have uh, any questions for Dr. Hiranandani. Uh, Lara, is there any, do we have time uh, for one or two questions? Madam? Lara is muted, I think. No. Uh, if anybody wants uh, any question from the panel uh, uh, to Mr. Hiranandani. Dr. Hiranandani, Vijay here. I don't know whether you can see me. No, I, I don't think you can see me. Uh, this is Vijay. Yeah. Doctor, um, we did a kind of a back of the envelope number crunching. Did the quantification of only the central government incentives, including the technology innovation grant. We jumped at it because our technology, as you know, 3D casting is eligible for TIG. It appeared, you know, with your chartered accountancy, with your industry leadership, I wanted you to check and tell us 
it appeared just the incentives of the government of India alone, not counting FSI, not counting state government incentives, over a period, if we take the interest subsidy also into account, can, over a period of 20 years, can pay for the building. You know, it's too big. So I was very, very, you know, kind of a skeptical about how could they, at least as a policy statement announced, you know, whether it happens or not, we need to wait. But I thought, you know, whether you had an opportunity to quantify those things and see whether that is real or just imaginary. Um, see, the point is very simple that the policy measure and the objectives are real. And the problem is real, Mr. Vijay, as you are aware, and I am also equally aware. The issue is that when the fine print does come out in terms of the policy measures and the financial implications, as well as the tax reliefs that come up, I think the items would be very much more clearer than that. But I think one of the things which is I found very transparent was the intent of the government was very clear. But however, you and I are both aware that many of the rollouts don't figure out in the manner in which the intent is. And uh, we will wait and look forward to all these incentives, as well as the policy measures which will come out in fine print ultimately. So I think the budget of India will actually, Mr. Vijay, give us a full picture as to how strongly they want to go into the rental housing segment. You must have also realized by now that a uh, huge amount of investment uh, incentives were given, are given under the PMAY, Pro Prime Minister's Avas Yoja. Uh, uh, so that has definitely worked out extremely well. A 3% interest subvention for a period of 15 years on houses up to 45 lakhs of rupees has been lapped up in the private sector also in a very huge way throughout the country. And a lot of it is working. But your question is a good question, uh, but I don't have that answer just now. I hope that the budget will clear it for you and me both. Thank, Thank you, Doctor. Let's hope and pray. Thank you, Doctor Hiranandani. Would you have time for another question or? One more question is fine. Okay. Um, I can see uh, Mr. Balaji Rao's video and he would like to answer, ask your question. Mr. Good evening, Balaji, sir. please introduce yourself and ask your question. Thank yeah, you. Good evening, sir. This is Balaji here. Uh, I just wanted to check with you, sir, if uh, through Naredco or through your good offices, whether rental housing also would be considered as a industry status as they gave it to affordable housing. But will affordable rental housing also get the industry status for banking purposes, which would be useful? and whether any loans given for the affordable rental housing complexes be considered as priority sector lending, which would give a good impetus to this whole movement. So Mr. Balaji Rao, the, it's a very good question. The answer is you will get priority, but now the banks have got so many matters on priority that somehow or the other, unless it's a fiscally a uh, financially prudent scheme, which ultimately has viability, uh, which I was just asked earlier, uh, unless that part of it does not work out uh, in, in, with the tax benefits, et cetera, does not work out, the banks will not be giving it. So A, the schemes have to be ultimately uh, viable end to end, whether it's one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, and uh, the banks will have to ascertain the uh, possibility that uh, with the rents coming in and the tax benefits, you would be able to pay back the loan. Then on the, only then will the banks give the money. Even if they are treated as priority loans, they will not get the loan because the banks now do not want to give the loans if they think that the viability is not there. So I don't think uh, there is anything else. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. And I'm so happy to be with you. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the Policy Lab core group and behalf of all the participants, uh, we'd like to extend a warm thank you to you for uh, taking time out to be with us. Thank you again, sir. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, yeah. thank you everyone. And uh, over to Lara to take the proceedings further. Yeah, over to you, Lara. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rajan. Thank you so much for uh, really holding uh, us all in that engaging uh, case study panel. 
and uh, now I uh, am going to um, introduce uh, the panel discussion. Um, this is what needs to be done to encourage private sector investment in rental housing. My panel of six experts are all here today with us. I'm going to introduce them uh, one by one and uh, request them to please switch on their videos. And uh, we have Mr. Balaji Rao, Managing Partner, Real Estate Access AMC Limited. Hello. Um, he's a Chartered Accountant and a PGDM from IIM Kolkata. He's a fellow member of the Royal Institute of Chartered uh, Surveyors. He has worked with Starwood Capital India, TCG Real Estate, ANZ Bank, Standard Chartered Bank. He's a seasoned real estate investment and asset manager, having over 25 years of experience in land acquisitions, property development, marketing, leasing, and capital structuring. And uh, we have, um, and he has a deep understanding of Indian markets and a track record of successfully developing diversified real estate projects. Mr. Dhyan Beliappa, he is the co-promoter and director of Arusha Homes Private Limited. He has over 23 years of experience in designing and managing housing projects. He's an architect with a master's in urban planning from SEPT University. He has worked on designing a range of products, including educational campus, institutional buildings, environment and heritage conservation sites, boutiques, restaurants, and homes. Dian, Mr. Dian has been an associate consultant to the Lal Mott McDonald for design of town panchayat office building for the town of Madur in Karnataka and also the de redevelopment of five lakes in Mysore. Mr. S.J. Vijay is the founder and director Salmon Leap Ventures of Home Mission India Private Limited, 35 years of experience in banking, finance, policy formulation, core and urban infra development. He established Salmon Leap in 2002 Salmon Leap Associates is a consultant providing insight-based services, expertise, and investment-based collaborations in the area of infrastructure, including special economic zones and digital infrastructure, solar energy, project finance, fund and asset management, and expertise sourcing and building. He's an alumni of the Jawaharlal Nehru University of New Delhi. We have Vishal Goel, co-founder, Sirestra Ventures. Vishal Goel is an alumni of Harvard Business School and Harvard Design School. He has more than 19 years of experience in investment advisory and in extensive exposure to global REIT practices in core business areas of operations, acquisition, financing, leading, and underwriting. As a partner of Sirestra Advisors, he conceptualized and executed investment strategy across its Indo in edu infra and business park verticals. He was also instrumental in conceptualizing and developing Genome Valley Knowledge Cluster in Hyderabad City. He has worked with Ernst & Young for over a decade and has been advisor to the government of Gujarat for Vibrant Gujarat 2005 to 2009. We have Rajesh Krishnan, Managing Director and CEO Brick Eagle Group. Rajesh Krishnan is the founder of Brick Eagle Group, a financial services platform focused on affordable housing. He started Brick Eagle in 2011 with a vision to deliver 1 million affordable homes by 2030. What started as a land banking company has transformed into an affordable housing ecosystem under his leadership. Till date, Brick Eagle has incubated five developers and eight service providers in the affordable housing sector. And my last and youngest panelist, Mr. Uday Lakkar, founder and CEO of Coho Co Living. He's a full time entrepreneur and investment management professional, experienced in private equity and venture capital investing, worked as an investment professional, consultant, and finance analyst across organizations like McKenzie, Morgan Stanley, ERIO, Capital 18, and EXL Service. He's the founder and uh, he's the founder of Coho Co-Living and Student Accommodation Brand in India. 
welcome everyone to this panel. Um, uh, do I have everyone here? Can I see Uday? Yes, all right. Yes, and we've already, yeah, thank you. We've already done a, a, a sound check. Um, now, all of us are aware of the policy. We've heard the two experts from South Africa and uh, from France and our learnings from Tamil Nadu. Uh, what I'm going to do now is to individually ask you to give your initial thoughts on the rental housing policy, the ARHC scheme, and uh, we'll uh, move uh, from Mr. Balaji first. Thank you, Lara. Uh, I think uh, when you look at in context of today's environment, uh, this uh, policy for affordable rental housing, what we are discussing today, uh, has just been very opportune uh, because uh, the housing for all, as uh, Dr. Hiranandani said, was supposed to be uh, trying to strive for a very high ratio of ownership like we do see in some countries. But it's not really viable or feasible in a diversified country like India and a developing country like ours. So this, uh, the rental housing concept, which was very much needed and uh, coming about in all dimensions, which is both on the land and infrastructure side, as well as on the physical incentive side, and then finally to get a model tenancy bill, which was the need and the crying need of the, I think would be a great, great impetus and a catalyst for really providing some sort of a roof on everyone's head. What most of us don't realize is actually the figures we have for India are pretty diffused because you can have a service which say that our home ownership is just 50 to 60% and some service which put pitch our home ownership even much higher at 70 to 80%. But the fact is, I don't think we should really strive for home ownership because the new generation, the millennials and the Gen Z, they seem to be more going on the experience side. And right. if you look at it, people are not really in a hurry to be always close to their place of work and have to own that house. They don't mind being further away or moving around. And for that, I think you need to bring in this whole concept of home ownership and home usage as being different. They need not always have to converge into one person. So I think now we are really realizing you need, you need, you have a developer, you might have an operator, you will have a home owner, and finally you will have a home user. And all four can be the four legs on which this whole table can stand of trying to put a roof on everyone's head. And the weakest sections, which is where we are looking at, whether it's the EWS, LIG, they are the ones who really need that home because even in a city like Mumbai, we all agree that half our population live in not pakka houses. They're all so kacha, they're all in shanties. So this is where I think this is gonna really transform a whole industry and a whole objective of providing housing for all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I really feel it does require the perspective shift from home ownership that will really give impetus to the rental housing market. And um, now, but uh, clearly we do need to see what we need to be providing in the EWS and LIG segments. I'm going to bring you back uh, after uh, this round. I'm going to um, uh, bring in um, Rajesh Krishnan here. Uh, who has uh, been working in the affordable housing sector and trying to provide affordable housing to uh, the low income group. So what is your take on now this perspective shift on to not owning but renting and the policy environment that is being created to support this? Uh, thanks a lot, Lara. I mean, are you able to hear me well? Yes, very well. Please go ahead. Excellent. Um, uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, see, I guess the starting premise is the rental yield in India is 2%. Uh, what does this mean? Um, essentially, uh, you know, it, it's much cheaper to rent than to own a house because yeah, mortgage rates are 8 10%. Um, and, and uh, you know, economically, it makes more sense to rent. Um, 
so so in that case why are people buying homes it's an emotional purchase and also investors traditionally have been betting on property price appreciation and hence there is a deep market for home buyers in the country yeah um so you know, coming back to uh, the question that you've raised on the rental housing policy i mean clearly the need for rental housing is is very clear but what i would like to uh, kind of highlight here is um essentially we got to look at the economic strata um if you're looking at the middle income and above uh, i think market based solutions are very viable right you got a lot of locked up homes and if you, so long as you have the right regulatory framework uh, between uh, landlords and tenants and uh, uh, with increasing a uh, number of uh, uh, rental service providers uh, who are able to find tenants and collect the rents and service these apartments um essentially i'm saying the middle income and above segments uh, uh will be well served if not they're already served uh but then the key challenge as you pointed out is is shortage of housing in the ews lig segment and that is the real elephant in the room uh yes. essentially you got migrant workers coming and sleeping on the streets and living in slums and uh, and essentially these guys can afford 5000 rupees a month perhaps um yeah. now the question is what can you do for them and uh, there i'm saying look especially in a city like mumbai uh, where land prices are exorbitant uh it is not economically viable uh even with all the incentives that are that have been talked about uh to provide rental housing solution uh, in in uh, the middle of mumbai unless we can make lands available uh, pretty much for uh, for free uh which i believe is on the cards essentially uh turns out a lot of the lands are locked up with defunct psus charitable uh, institutions the railway is a large land owner in city centric locations uh so i i guess what is being discussed here is essentially uh, can we get these lands uh, you know made available for uh, rental housing Uh, so the pitch to let's say a charitable institution which has this land is as follows saying hey you, you know you have no use for this land you don't have money to develop it uh, you can't sell it as per uh, your uh, norms um so hey why don't you uh, lease me this land for 25 30 years i will spend my money construct uh, you know uh, create rental housing stock create cash flows uh, uh, return money to my investors and after 30 years the land and building is yours uh, with established cash flows it's a bot model uh, and that can totally work and can be done in scale i can see a lot of uh, players uh, who can fund the construction construct and and deliver um uh but then i guess the 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 question is you know if, if again if you have to make it available at 5000 rupees a night even assuming a 200 square feet home um essentially you can barely fund construction essentially what this means is the landlord is not going to get market yield for his land so the land has to be made available uh, at a deeply subsidized rate um for this to work which is what i guess the government is considering right thanks rajesh for really pointing out the fact that you seem to see the land as the critical uh, hindrance over here um, the model the darc scheme does uh, offer two models which is one where the builders use their own land and the other where uh, the vacant housing is converted into the arc complexes and those are rented out and i'm uh, sure that uh, uh, mr sj vijay will be able to throw more light upon what the team has in terms of incentives and concessions that uh, can draw the private sector and i'm going to come back to you rajesh with the comparative between the sra and the rental and then we'll have a chat there but can i bring in sj vijay here to really talk about uh, the the incentives of the policy and uh, to address the issue uh, of uh, land and uh, 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 decent returns to the private sector lara thanks and uh, you know most of them are familiar faces there in fact i have interacted with vishal rajesh is a good old friend balaji and i have run into each other uh, when i was young so so you know going into you hit upon land you hit upon uh, incentives and um, rajan in his introduction said 
let's figure during the panel discussion on this lab, what's the target group? What's going to be the possible ROI? What is the subsidy going to do as far as augmenting the ROI to at least a viability level? This is the broad context, uh, you know, with I have been jotting down a few things. So let's take the typical consultant framework. I think we shouldn't be happy. Uh, consultant framework is, um, what, was, what is it that this affordable rental housing complex scheme is trying to deliver? Bring in the land, either from public sector or from private sector or from industrial estate or from railway, like Rajesh was saying, or from charitable institutions. Try and pull the land, which is a critical resource, from as many sources as possible. And when it comes to buildings, as um, almost all of us are aware, they said that constructing building as the way we have been constructing is time consuming, wasteful, inefficient, la la la. So they said, okay, here is the 600 crores, which I am putting aside and saying anybody who goes to, you know, manufacture the built environment, hey, come here, I will give you 10% of the construction cost approximately as a grant, as a subsidy, which you don't have to pay. In fact, they quantified if it is affordable rental housing complex scheme, 20,000 rupees per bed is available as grant if you are using uh, manufacturing based construction technology. So how do we put it into context? So government in its policy has taken this into four buckets, incentives, like we discussed Lara, where the government is taking money out of its pocket and putting on the table. Second is the exemptions. Hey, you got to pay income tax, I will exempt. You got to pay GST, I'll exempt. Hey, you got to pay charges for land use conversion, I shall exempt. You need to pay money for additional FSI, I shall exempt. So category one was incentive where the government is putting money on table from its own coffers. Second is what we ought to have paid, they're saying don't pay because it is for this purpose. Third one is concessions. Concessions, you know, those of us who have delved into the policy know the utility rates are at residential rate. The property tax is at residential rate. So they are not treating us as a commercial venture and they're giving us those concessions. Third was the privilege. The privilege is when you are operating the affordable rental housing complex. Yeah, he's back. All yeah. right, we've just missed you for about a few seconds. Oh, I'm sorry. Where, 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 where could you? Up to yeah, what? Yeah, just point? please continue. Yeah. So yeah. we talked about, you know, just to recapitulate, we talked about incentives, exemptions, concessions, yeah. and privileges. And those were the four buckets into which the policy tried to do whatever it can, one from. It is, it is a central scheme. It is not a centrally sponsored scheme. You know, big difference between a central scheme and a centrally sponsored scheme as far as the budgetary allocations and funding is concerned. And that is why whether it is a technology investment, technology innovation grant or the income tax exemption or the GST exemption, most of the money is coming from the central government coffers. Yeah, one, two, let's go back and into the framework of saying, you know, what is the target group? Uh, right now, it is saying uh, LIG, EWS. EWS, as per definition, is 25,000 rupees per month income. LIG is 50,000 rupees per month income. When it says income, it says family income. But it also says students. It also says people who are traveling for a purpose into the urban areas. So, like Mr. Dr. Hiran Adlani was saying, we need to look at the fine print to see whether this 25,000 rupees per month or 50,000 rupees per month is going to be the individual's income in the new location, urban location he is going to be living, or is it going to be aggregating all the incomes of the family as a whole? There is a kind of a clarification that is being sought that will define our target group. We, we are still don't have clarity. Right now we are going by the definition of family income. So what we can do as we discuss is put the land building occupancy 
and the operations, what is provided for in the, in the policy, and also look at which is the target group as we go ahead uh, in the panel. You know, I just thought I'll throw the framework and, and then, you know, we probably will, you know, use the framework to keep on dissecting and seeing whether we get some insights. Thank you, Lara. Right. Thank you, um, Vijay, sir. That's uh, really helpful. I mean, you have uh, put the policy for us as a, as a framework, and I, and I uh, do believe the other panelists will also try and uh, kind of pick on the other points that are uh, presenting as a roadblock for the private sector to really look at this uh, as, 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 as developing a viable model uh, to coming in. Uh, I'm going to be asking uh, Ms. Dian Veliapa to... Uh, uh, who comes from uh, over a decade of experience on shared accommodation with the Arusha homes, his own experience of uh, working with governments uh, uh, for the LIG segment uh, in um, housing. Uh, so uh, your thoughts on this new rental housing policy and how um, um, more uh, ventures like Arusha can kind of uh, work at different segments of the RHC and uh, cater to the different segments of society and perhaps go lower down in the in the bottom uh, towards the bottom of the pyramid. Okay. Uh, thanks, Lara. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, so as Lara said, Arusha Homes, we've been in this space of providing shared accommodation for singles primarily, not families, across income groups uh, since I think 2008. So that makes it about 13 years of operations that we've been doing this and uh, and therefore uh, you know i uh, would like to share some of our experience that we have had dealing with some of the bottlenecks or the roadblocks that i think mr vijay also mentioned okay uh, which uh, primarily has to do I, the key thing at least in this segment which is the ligews segment is that the ability to pay is very low which we all know and therefore, for any operator, especially uh, when it comes to the singles, I'm sure it is uh, the same holds good for the families as well. Uh, the margins are very thin. So the only thing that will make it viable or work worthwhile for an, for, an, uh, for an agency or an operator would be scale. And uh, given that, uh, we would have to actually uh, look at what are the bottlenecks that one needs to address. So we, uh, just to uh, recap, we a couple of years back, we tried this experiment at Chakan, where we worked with the industrial workers and uh, we tried it for about a year. And the key thing, of course, was, uh, you know, the entry level, I mean, the people who move in from the rural areas, as Dr. Hiranandani mentioned, that uh, it's, you know, people come from certain areas and move into certain, you know, four or five different areas across India. And most of them are not families. The families come in much later. Primarily, it is the individuals who move, they get a job, and then they send money back home. And as a result, their ability to pay towards housing is very limited. And uh, they're extremely value conscious. We've tried working with uh, security guards for uh, the organization called G4S. That was much earlier. Uh, Chakan was, I think, four years back. But what we would also like to bring to this uh, discussion is, uh, you see, we also operate at a white collar, entry level, white collar level, you know, uh, shared uh, accommodation for uh, maybe entry level tech, uh, techies or even students for that matter. And what we find is that over time, compared to when we started, there is now an asset class being created. Individual, private, individual landowners building to cater to the segment because they see higher returns from this segment as opposed to renting it out to say uh, families. Okay. Now we don't see that ha having happened at this segment as such till now, but given the right incentive, given, you know, what uh, the current policy is uh, promoting, maybe it will take a couple of years and then you are able to create the ecosystem that will enable other operators to come in because uh, we operate on a rental model. We do not own the properties and therefore rent, you know, which is a function of the land value 
is our biggest cost so how does one you know going back to mr rajesh krishnan's comment about you know land being critical so for us it would be rent which would be you know uh, the contributing factor about how one would make it affordable and therefore what does this policy talk about how it you know uh, you are addressing this particular issue the other thing i'd like to uh, mention is also the scale you know like we feel that our at least our initial in, uh, indicators are that the market size for single uh, you know people in uh, the larger metropolitan cities and uh, you know some of the even the tier 2 or tier 3 cities is upwards of 10 million now how do you bring that into this whole thing of where we feel that the uh, focus is more towards families and it's credible that for the first time the government of india has actually spoken about an affordable rental policy in fact i am standing in for satya today my colleague who is also the ceo of arusha who was part of the first rent task force on rental housing which was chaired by i think uh, jerry rao and we brought in that uh, thing of uh, you know a hostel into an affordable rental uh, you know the discussion uh, point because before that i don't think uh, pe- nobody ever spoke about hostels as a viable model to cater to uh, rental housing okay so having said that i i would like to add one last thing that uh, one of our, the other things that we have you know and which i think the mr hiranandani also pointed out even though the policy does talk about financing whether the banks will lend or not lend is another key issue and funding is extremely critical for this so how does one address that uh, not just through equity but also through debt you know and uh, going forward as i said if that some of these incentives can also be uh, kind of uh, i mean allocated even to existing operators not just the people who come in now i think that would be uh, important yeah thank Hi, you thank you thank you dhyan and that uh, uh, um, that's nice of you to really direct me to uh, my next speaker and uh, i'm going to come back uh, to you about uh, the challenges of running uh, the migrant worker housing in chakkan in pune but uh, before that i want to bring in uh, vishal goel to really answer what dhyan has put on the table for us as to finding finance uh, for uh, this um, in the implementation of this policy your views vishal thank you um, great to be on this panel um, and i think least qualified to be on this panel but i'll try to uh, make uh, some notes here first of all i think uh, you know till now we see this entire problem of rented uh, housing as a b2c problem where we are working with the end customer and we want to work with the end customer who is the resident i think the way we look at it is uh, why not think of it as a b2b problem and uh, you know work with the businesses who need the migrant workers work uh, with those institutions who now understand that labor cannot be taken for granted and the disruption of labor can really really disturb their businesses in a very bad way and i think that is what we are trying to do so when we look at it from our perspective we believe that unless uh, the business and the government policy incorporates uh, the business into this com- uh, rented accommodation we will only be having either uh, a sort of a subsidy for um, low cost housing and it will actually you know then has to be rented out by a, a sort of a owner who is incentivized by the increasing price of the housing it will be very very difficult to create a pure play purpose built uh, you know com- accommodation at a low price of rent so i think we i will request you to look at it from a sort of a b2b perspective we are engaging with multiple companies in india on a b2b perspective especially large employers in apparel industry large uh, employees in the engineering industry who are looking at uh, people more than 500 to 1000 people they are mission critical covid has exposed us all about uh, you know villages not allowing us to let people step out to work and produce uh, you know essentials like pharmaceuticals vaccine and i think uh, you know it is very critical that we start looking 
at this entire perspective from a B2B perspective. Now, what could be solutions? Uh, as you know, we do have a contract uh, labor act. We, every employer has to show that, um, you know, he has, uh, you know, when he has to take a contract labor regulation act, he has to take a sort of a certificate uh, from, from the government that he is going to take care of the employees. These are the employees on the site. And he's almost like a principal employer, although they are contract employees. Can we look at a systematic uh, phase-wise uh, approach over the next five years where the Contract Labor Regulation Act has to show availability and access and contractual access to uh, rented housing? And unless uh, he is able to show that within a vicinity, he will not be allowed to deploy those workers on the site. And uh, like we had the Factories Act and the Contract Labor Act, we can actually you know, allow uh, you know, some of the, you know, I know it is very abused these days, wherever there's a problem, we run to the CSR money. But uh, even if a employer is using its own CSR money to create uh, affordable rented accommodation along with a contractor, that is, that is one part of uh, the way we at Serestra is looking at this problem. We are working with a large employer in Vizac who is into apparels to create such uh, 5,000 people. Second part of it, which is equally important, as soon as the employer takes the responsibility of such uh, housing or he gets involved in it, and one of the reasons why they have not got uh, involved in it is the responsibility of hygiene, safety, and ability to pass the examination uh, on, on, on uh, pass the sort of audit of their end customers, be it a, a Foxconn, be it a Brandex, be it a Victoria's Secret, all of them would then like to see what type of labor welfare is in place and whether they are living in safe uh, hygienic uh, premises. So I think, uh, you know, I, I keep quoting this, don't get me wrong, but, you know, in the US, most of the jails are owned by, or what they call as correction centers are owned by private companies and government, uh, you know, uh, leases it and pays a sort of a fee per, uh, per prisoner or per person who is in the correction center. When we design these facilities, uh, knowing the type of people who will be uh, living in these for the first time in organized homes, getting uh, staff to keep the toilets clean, to keep the place livable, will be extremely challenging. So there are there also needs to be a lot of work to be done on the design, which gives the privacy to a worker uh, for staying long term. The Dubai model or the Singapore model, where there were international migrant workers. Uh, may not work post-COVID. We have to relook at the design parameters. We also need to really look at a operational company or a framework for the blue-collar workers, people who are earning less than 20,000 rupees. And there are lots of people who are earning less than 20,000 rupees. So I think um, that is that is where I would say the challenge is between creating and operating. There have to be two different bodies, one who creates and one who operates and creates a long-term B2B model uh, of, of purpose-built uh, rented accommodation. And then obviously my last remark would be on clarity from the government on incentive. I think, uh, you know, whatever I read from the policy, there are a lot of if and buts, you know, uh, is it a residential accommodation or is it a commercial accommodation? So if you're doing a dorm, do I have to pay GST on the rent? Uh, because I'm not collecting it directly from the, from the end user which is exempted so if you if i'm collecting it from the end user there is no gst but if i'm collecting from the company there is a gst because that company is renting those services and things like that so there's a lot of clarity which can be bought into that and there could be a lot of uh, you know frameworks which can be uh, created around it and uh, you know we will be very keen as a participant of creating almost 50000 beds uh, in, in 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 this ecosystem where we bring in the capital and, uh, you know, we, where we support the blue collar workers for large industrial groups. And I think uh, some of the places where we can make a start, the land is not very expensive. We are still looking at almost just a 200 rupees per square feet FSI cost, even if we don't go tall and we build only 50,000 uh, per acre. But the operational cost, the GST impact on operational cost, and some of, some of those uh, elements need to be visited. And the policy should cover B2B because currently policy is completely quiet about a B2B arrangement. 
Thank you, Vishal. I mean, uh, you've really brought out uh, a lot of points for us. One, uh, policy advocacy and for us to kind of really look at uh, uh, how uh, uh, other policies can support uh, the implementation of uh, rental housing. Uh, and uh, you have uh, brought out the question of uh, operations and maintenance. And we have uh, uh, Uday Lakkar with us, who's uh, run a, a Coho Living for uh, now a decade. So uh, I think he can really share about his experience uh, on running shared accommodation. And uh, also maybe if he can talk about uh, the aspect of affordability of rent for different segments. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Lara. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, again, uh, just like Vishal said, I'm probably quite ill-equipped uh, to comment. But yeah, I'll try to share a perspective which has not been covered as much. I guess we have covered the majors out here in terms of uh, uh, government subsidy, in terms of uh, requirement for land, uh, in terms of tax exemptions, uh, and many other aspects, right? Uh, uh, ambiguity in terms of uh, uh, regulations which are there in most laws uh, which are enacted uh, quite impromptu uh, in our country. Right. So, uh, so I'll try to cover a few other dimensions probably uh, so that I can add my two cents to the discussion here. Um, one of the thoughts, uh, so it's been half a decade, uh, Lara, that we have been building this, not one decade, just a correction here. So uh, Diane is far more experienced than me, right? So my experience is just half a decade. And in that half a decade experience, I've had a, a, a variety of audience to touch base with, whether it's the students or nurses uh, for whom we have been building accommodation, some experimentation with industrial housing, besides uh, young professionals, whether it is IT professionals or otherwise, right? So uh, so few of the thoughts um, that I'll, I'll just put to the table out here is, um, very interestingly, the lifestyle requirements of people in a certain age bracket are fairly similar. For instance, somebody who is uh, earning, say, 15,000 rupees, a nurse, or say, an industrial housing person, or uh, somebody who is an office boy or a housekeeper, and somebody who is working in an IT company, it's not very different. For example, everybody wants to own a smartphone for sure. Right, something which is uh, just, just to give an uh, analogy out here, somebody who earns fifteen thousand, we should not rule out the fact that that person will not be having a phone which is more than seven thousand. It, it 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 is very very often seen out here, right? So so the requirement for Wi-Fi that we get even in the uh, in the uh, in the MIG category or LG category is very high. So uh, similarly for food requirement, we might assume in our head that uh, uh, that based on the income strata, people might uh, prefer a certain kind of food or otherwise. And uh, in reality, at least on ground, I've been um, quite surprised uh, that uh, the, the requirements are more age-centric as compared to, um, uh, what you say, uh, income-centric, right? So that's one of the thoughts, right, uh, that, that I would want to bring to, to the table here, particularly when people migrate to tier one cities or tier 1.5 to tier two cities and all, then that requirement changes, uh, at least in terms of the mind space. Second thing is, um, of course, uh, government land is always a good idea, uh, right? To, to help support uh, support the thing. So out here, I heard two different thoughts. One from Vishal, who talked about lower FSI cost of 200 rupees square feet, and one from Rajesh. I think when he mentioned about that uh, charitable institutions and uh, um, government railways and so many people owning lands and how that can be unlocked uh, for building something like that. Now, uh, a thought um, uh, as a professional, I always come across is land is a state subject in India. And a lot of this policy documentation or policy initiatives are central uh, government uh, initiatives and all. So anything that we uh, think about, uh, so I think uh, Dr. Hiranandani mentioned in the beginning that uh, depending upon which government uh, is having how much influence in the in the states and all, the policy implementation tends to change, right? So out here, that's one of the factors that we have uh, found as an operator who is in North India, South India, West India and all, that it tends to vary drastically. So that's another thing that we have noted. Uh, quite often, right? That uh, difference between uh, state government and central government as far as land is concerned. And which brings me to a, uh, an ancillary point is that why do migrants, uh, why do people migrate, right? Uh, even in the LIG, MIG category, why do people migrate to, to tier one or tier two cities? So, so migration need not necessarily be always in the, uh, in, the, in the heart of the city, right? For example, we have something in Chennai, in Uragadam, right? Which is an industrial hub. I think Vishal mentioned about something in Vizak where uh, uh, it's about textiles and all that, right? So it's a variety of things. We do nurses accommodation, which is in the eastern part of Delhi, in uh, just uh, abutting uh, Ghaziabad in North India. Right? So something might be in Sonipat and something might be in different parts, right? So migration can happen for a variety of reasons. It could be students who require uh, such accommodation and all, uh, very similar framework applicable to them. Dormitories, as we are calling the words, or hostels, like Diane mentioned, I think, right? 
or um, uh, industrial housing uh, in case of say large industrial houses now uh, we are doing something in haidwar uh, out there so uh, so the, so so the catchment comes from industrial housing out there and all that and the land cost is not really a challenge or land is not really a challenge right so so, so depending upon which which pocket of uh, migrant are you addressing that that becomes challenge so that's a thought again to put it so vishal mentioned about b2b another corollary to that point i would like to add here is uh, based on my experience in the last half a decade is most of the organizations today do not want to provide accommodation on their own they are more than happy to provide cash or money and let people find their own accommodation surprisingly and when i de delved more into it why is it so largely the psychology came from the fact that i don't want to take up liability for the person right if something goes amiss or something goes wrong uh, who takes the liability so that's when probably a lot of these um, um, operators like coho itself and arusha for that matter or many others across the country right so i guess uh, that role comes in wherein the uh, the person uh, or the entity is okay to pay the money for example with iit delhi we have a contract in iit pay the subsidy with max healthcare there is a contract where max pays that right so people are okay shelling out the money in many cases the uh, whether it's government or whether it's private but sometimes they're not okay taking the liability of operations right so i guess um, which brings me to a policy initiative um, uh, point out here is that one when we talk about affordable housing or rental act and all i guess operations as a thought uh, gets a bit of a back burner we often talk about just uh, taxation or um, what you say uh, fsi or uh, construction benefits etc which is great which is obviously the stepping stone on which uh, something is built and everything i guess there needs to be more clarity um, uh, and some uh, help in terms of operations because when i mentioned about uh, lifestyle being similar So it's not very different when I'm catering to an IT employee uh, at, at an entry level, 22 year old versus the person who is a security guard out here. The, the salary bracket might be might not be very different. It might be just different to five thousand bucks in their in their take homes, right? Frankly, right? And the lifestyle requirement is same. So I guess on the operational front, uh, again, uh, some policy initiatives can can be very very helpful because once the things are constructed, right, then uh, on an ongoing basis for the next 20 years, it's operations for you. right so that's one thought that i would like to put on the table um and uh, second was also the fact that we we should look at it in a fragmented manner also quite often uh, the the land pockets are um uh, are diversified for example when i look at gurgaon or even bangalore for that matter quite often land pockets are are, are there because say sector was uh, uh, was allotted for township or for a particular use case institutional land purpose and say maybe there is a half an half an acre land parcel which is lying there which is just just vacant right i guess um, uh, we should not be um, refraining from uh, taking the approach of small pockets uh, which uh, which could be very highly accessible and all because remember this ews category all the residential uh, accommodation or townships which were created everybody had a provision of ews it is just that it was never executed in the right manner and people keep selling that and all and there are different people who are staying and uh, to this rich people those who are actually uh, serving the whether it's the maids or guards or cooks or drivers and everything they finally don't have accommodation to stay there and they end up staying in shanties right so so there has to be uh, use cases which are defined and in nearby pockets out there and the land is available i see that day in day out in front of me and it has to be addressed at the state level also so this was some thank of the you that came to my head yeah. thanks 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 today i Can i i just I'm, lara I'm, uh, just uh, just make one small point here uh, before i'm sorry uh, saying uh, most of the corporates are spending anyway between 3 to 5000 rupees in transporting their employees to the homes which they have chosen and uh, most of them spend 30 to 40 minutes in the buses and i at least can bet that there is almost a million such workers who are being transported at the cost of 3000 to 5000 rupees in buses to places which are like like semi slums instead of the same money going to build a, a sort of a cyclable distance uh, uh, you know affordable rented housing Yeah, thanks, Vishal. I mean, I really feel then that's the point of urban planning, and uh, uh, we are only going to be looking at that in places which are looking at new master plans. And and I'm sure that uh, uh, the all urban planners are listening and on how we can reduce commuting uh, time and uh, cost. Uh, this conversation is uh, a lot about uh, the middle income group. I'm going to drive us back. uh to really why the arc scheme came about to mr balaji who really uh has spoken about the use of vac vacant stock uh 
and uh, how one can uh, look at new townships and what uh, needs to be done to bring in the different stakeholders to make different townships uh, to uh, happen, viable townships to happen, to really take care of uh, the migrant uh, population that comes into cities to work. Yeah, uh, excellent uh, question, uh, Lara, because I believe the policy should look at each of these stakeholders and figure out what are the policy initiatives they can give or the incentives. Like, for example, if you start with the land and the infrastructure, we all believe, given that it is going to the weaker sections, the land has to be subsidized or given on a BOT on a free basis. We believe that the government has to provide for infrastructure to these places so that the developer is not taxed by doing that. So th that has to be separated and looked at as a separate bucket. Then for a developer, we need the single window clearances, the additional FSI or FAR that is needed, waiver of charges for, as uh, somebody mentioned, of the CLU change in land use. So you will need to have a separate chapter and a separate focus on how we need to develop these places as townships. Then you come to the financing part of it, which as the policy in the policy document so far, I've seen it has skimmed around, but not really addressed it. And uh, believe me, unless we can figure out the viable option I think nothing works out here. So whether we look at people having to give money for these projects on a priority sector lending, or whether equity, in my opinion, what I propose is that the equity should come in through what I would call creation of an impact fund. Because if you create an impact fund and you bring it with some sort of a fiscal incentives of a maybe a pass-through tax status naturally, but more importantly, a tax exemption status, then we can even lower the expected returns the equity holders might have when they try to finance such projects. So we can create an impact fund, which is large enough, just like uh, the government sponsored or pushed forward the Swami fund for the stressed projects. So you can have a sort of an impact fund out here, which will really help in creating the equity base to create such townships or such complexes for affordable rental housing. So financing needs to be addressed along with its fiscal overtones in its own separate focused manner. And then finally, we look at the operators, what they need in order to ensure the clarity as somebody was saying as to whether it's commercial or residential or whether you have the applicability of GST or TDS, all these sort of things can be sorted out for the operator. And then only I think when we look at all this, does the user come in and I would assume the model becomes viable, financially viable. And the way it is looking as uh, we find the rentals are creeping up, especially when it is serviced real estate and people have thrown in some sort of services along with just the bare bones. So I, instead of two to 3%, we do look at rentals today, which are creeping up to four to 6% and maybe even go up higher based on the context. So with rentals creeping up, with mortgage loans coming down, I think it's becoming a viable situation where you can have impact funds created to give equity for it. You can get loans from banks on a priority sector lending basis and create this sort of a thing, actually happen, make it practical and make it implementable. But I think there are a lot of stakeholders from the government to the financial institutions, to the developers, to the operators. And we all have to come on to a panel and we all have to come on to a forum to discuss this thoroughly and figure out as to how do you make this actually roll out on the ground. So it is interesting and I think this is a good start, but I think we need to slowly deep dive in separate workshops for each of these verticals and look very okay. No, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Rao, for really um, uh, putting it positively, constructively. And of course, we have a lot of uh, uh, to take forward to. And uh, the model that you're talking about, I saw Rajesh smiling. So maybe I'm bringing him and see if there is enough political will to make this happen. Um, uh, thanks, Lata. Uh, a couple of things uh, before I start on political will uh, to add to uh, Balaji's point. Uh, see, uh, funding is, is a problem for affordable housing. The whole sector is capital starved. Um, 
for what it is worth, some four years back, uh, affordable housing was declared infrastructure status. Uh, but then, um, uh, essentially, RBA never uh, sent a note to banks uh, telling, uh, instructing them how to deal with affordable housing differently. And as a result, it did not move the needle at all. Uh, for what it is worth, there is a provision under which a project loan to affordable housing projects could be treated as ESL. As far as I know, not a single project in the country qualifies the stringent conditions they have. Of course, home loans uh, to affordable housing buyers is PSL, uh, but then project loans uh, were never qualified. Uh, so as a result, I'm saying project funding for affordable housing sector per se it remains a challenge. Uh, so if you're serious about implementing affordable housing uh, in scale, uh, we need to solve the affordable housing and the funding challenge. Uh, perhaps we can uh, uh, take some uh, leave from uh, the U.S., uh, where uh, they use LIHTC bonds. Um, uh, uh, do you hear me? Lara? Yes, go ahead. Yes, yes. Okay. See, the U.S. has this thing called LIHTC bonds, which is uh, low-income housing tax credit bonds where investors in these uh, uh, projects uh, get full tax break upfront for the investment they've made. And that is the way they were able to fund the construction of millions of rental homes in the US. We can pretty much copy the same idea here uh, in India. That would be one way to uh, uh, make uh, funding available for rental housing. Uh, and, and coming back to uh, uh, political will, uh, for what it is worth, Lara, I was talking to you earlier, uh, we, we were part of uh, the, the, uh, the consortium that bid for the redevelopment of Dharavi. And one of the key points that we made there is the, is the pressing need for rental housing uh, to solve the Dharavi problem. Uh, essentially, uh, the challenge is as follows. Uh, say in, in a typical SRA, uh, the people who stay in the ground floor are deemed to be homeowners and they get a free home. Uh, whereas in a place like Dharavi, you've got people living in, in the first floor, second floor, third floor. These are all kacha structures. And these are typically rented by the guy who owns the ground floor. And they're paying 5,000 rupees a month rent. Uh, in a typical SRA, uh, the developer will go and just pay them a few thousand rupees and ask the renters to just go and find some other place to squat. Uh, whereas when you're talking about a project like Dharavi, you're talking half a million people. And even if you were to pay them uh, physically, uh, you know, there's no place for them to go and squat. Uh, so if you're serious about solving a problem in that scale, uh, we said, hey, we need to construct 100,000 rental homes uh, uh, within Bombay Island. So I said, so we basically said, hey, you have salt and land here uh, where, you know, you're not, able, you know, and can we use that uh, for solving this rental housing problem? Wherein we said, yeah. government, you own the land, you remain the owner of the land but then allow us to construct rental stock uh, to solve this Dharavi problem. Uh, right. But then to cut a long story short, uh, we, didn't get, we didn't find the political will to do so. Right, I think, um, uh, well, uh, we will have to discuss uh, uh, the pros and cons of the previous uh, policies to deal with uh, uh, how the, the, the need of housing in the affordable uh, section and uh, uh, your experience can be brought up uh, again, but uh, the issue you're clearly talking about is the use of unused land, and uh, that is really critical to this rental housing uh, uh, policy. I will want to bring in uh, uh, SJ Vijay, who is very positive about the policy, and if he can answer some of the questions that uh, uh, and the points that Palaji Rao and Rajesh Krishnan have raised. SJ Vijay. Yeah, Lara, and uh, I, I share the pain with uh, Rajesh because, um, you know, like he said four years back, uh, I was also jubilant and celebrating when they said it is uh, affordable housing projects will be funded under the priority sector lending category. Sector it, lending, it, right. is, uh, it is uh, not a happy situation that it did not get funded to the extent it should have been or like Rajesh is, none of them got funded. That is a fact. And uh, today, if you look at affordable rental housing complex scheme, we are talking about, you know, Rvalaji will probably agree or he will give clarification. As ex-bankers, we know 
there is one class of asset which probably has the least of the risk. That is uh, real estate, building, land and building, either owned or as an as a asset class together, probably holds among the lowest of the risk factors. If we take that into account and say, okay, let us, can we do the project financing under whatever the government of India said, all of us have read through the policy. Government of India said this will be funded for a period of 20 years. Affordable rental housing complex project will be funded on a door to door tenure of 20 years. And that too, at a rate of seven to eight percent. That is the intent. Now, in India, we can always debate whether the intent will be executed. Let us for a minute agree or wish, hope that it will be executed. If that is the case, we are talking about X amount of you know, advantage we get as a developer, number one. Number two, if you are talking about, you know, Vishal raised a brilliant point. He said, hey, listen, you have said GST exempted. GST from who to who is exempted? Yeah. And I am coming in as a corporate entity, B2B, yeah. will I have the exemption? Uh, Vishal, um, uh, this may not, you know, really comfort you, but I just will share this. In the same country, to develop something called a policy and turn it into act, we spent seven years. And to, to destroy it, people took only about four or five years. You know, the government did not only government at fault, the people can destroy anything that you create very, very rapidly. Hence, there is a very fine uh, walk we have to do. And I think as far as enabling the affordable rental housing to the extent one hears, if I believe, I think the financing will be available. Then they came in and said, hey, all this is great. There is a number of land parcels lying around where I am sitting. Why can't I put it into use? Why do we keep crying about this parcel of land versus that parcel of land? If any of you had an opportunity to find the English translation of the Gujarat affordable rental housing complex policy, you would be very happy to note to what level of detail they have gone into. In fact, and you know, for Vishal and Uday who are already in this area, the government of Gujarat is very keen that they are wanting to give you the land next to or in the industrial estates to be developed exclusively as industrial housing and have the other state governments also come in and done. Uh, I haven't seen the released one, but I keep hearing we will kind of emulate, they didn't say copy, emulate the central and the Gujarat uh, affordable rental housing complex policy. That was as far as uh, the availability of land for operators the intent at the ministry level, I, I was not involved in drafting, but I did have a kitchen view when it was being cooked, is to have an operator, whether it is for the existing government housing stock to be put into affordable rental housing, as well as the new one. My industrial clients, Uday was absolutely right, Vishal, you were also right. They said, except the construction companies who have the labor at site, everybody else says, I will give the land. You bring in a developer, more than developer, I want an operator because I do not want to get into the liabilities of operating it and facing the consequences. Right. I, I, I kept thinking that, you know, an entity like Habitat for Humanity or an entity which really wants to do this as a kind of a meaningful, tangible service can become an operator, or if it makes it economic sense, maybe Uday, maybe Vishal, maybe Balaji. Sorry, maybe not Balaji, maybe, uh, you know, the gentleman, um, the other gentleman who was running the houses. I, I Dian. Yeah, Dian. Yeah. Dian, Dian Beliapa. He can, he yeah. can. So, you know, and, uh, and when it came to the next question, 
uh, I, I was you know, in love with what Vishal said, hey, when you take a labor from the contract uh, labor provider, yes. you have insisted, show me the PF registration. It is not too far to demand. Maybe you know, that is an action item we should take to government, Dara. Say, yeah. show me the access he has for the affordable rental housing, which is as per the norms or standards. Yeah? Yes. And another, another point which I noted down in the discussion was someone was saying, I think Mr. Uh, Mr. Beliapa was saying, hey, how do I provide affordable rental housing for the industrial worker? There is an interesting case study in, in, in Bangalore. I'm sure you know, people here in the panel would already know about it. A guy who went and took all the floors which are built but not sold, put some money, made it usable, and he is giving it to the, the chowkidars, the security guards, and et al. at a very simple pricing pattern of 50 rupees per night. Right. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Vijay. I mean, uh, uh, very, very important uh, points brought up there. And uh, 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 since you have uh, spoken about uh, Mr. Dhyan Beliapa, I'd, I'd like him to come in again and really share his experience of how uh, his uh, worker, uh, worker housing did not, uh, uh, the challenges that it faced in Chakan, in Pune, and that he kind of um, um, put into context as to why he uh, asked that question. Okay, uh, uh, my apologies. There's some problem with my mic, so I'm not able to hear what you've been saying, but I will just uh, connect back to some of the points that were raised, and I think Mr. Vijay also raised them, uh, so did Vishal and even, uh, I think, uh, Rajesh. Uh, about working with the organization and the challenges of working with the organization, I think Uday also mentioned that, that you know, many organizations do not want to take that liability they do not want the pain of having to deal with complaints coming from on a regular basis because we face that not so much with the organizations, but when we did this uh, work with the skill development program of the government of Andhra, that was I think in 2009, and uh, where the trainees would then do a month's on-the-job training, which was also being uh, funded by the program, and we... Uh, provided accommodation for them in, in either Hyderabad or Bangalore. And it became a big thing because there were issues about food, there were issues about, you know, and food, I'm sure Uday will uh, agree with me, is a hot, you know, after Wi-Fi, the maximum complaints come about food, right? So irrespective of which sector you're, or which segment of income you're catering to, food, and especially when you have such a diverse uh, population, you have people from Kashmir, you know, without exaggeration, Gujarat to Assam, everybody and food habits are different. So those are huge challenges and most organizations do not want to get into that. So the much rather, you know, as uh, I, I think Uday mentioned that, that give the money and say, you know, you fend for yourself. And the challenges for us, especially when you're dealing with that segment for the operator is one, uh, it, uh, as I said, the margins are very low. To the risk of this person just walking off, you know, the uh, employee quitting his job and then he just disappears. So then you're, whether you take your uh, rent in advance or you take it because most of them do not even pay advances, you know, whereas in the slightly higher priced uh, bracket, you can claim advances. But here, even that advance, that luxury is not there because that person lands up from his village with nothing. So... And it is also uh, subject to the vagaries of hiring. One of the things why Chakan didn't work out for us is hiring dropped that particular year by almost 75%. So the first two months we did reasonably well and we thought we had the model and then we kind of uh, scaled up only to find that you know, suddenly there was a, almost like a freeze. And even our first project in uh, Chennai, which was, I think, in 2008, was again for industrial workers, price point of 600 uh, that we did without food. And then we found that without food, this model doesn't work. You know, So it has to be a full service operation when you're doing it for singles. But the challenges are multiple. You, know, you have, uh, say, a, a hiring freeze. Suddenly you are, you are stuck because it's only the new employees who come in, who kind of come into an organized space. 
you know it's very unlikely that somebody who's already moved into an accommodation shared with three or four people with what they perceive as higher levels of freedom will suddenly move back into this however good your service may be you see so those are challenges which you know sometimes the organize so who do you look for backing you know just like you have say the uh, you know you, you look at support from the government but you would also need something viable happening here as support from the organization and you know and memories are short like for now yes they will feel the need and maybe for the next 6 months to a year then the organization will say okay i need to support this but how many of those organizations will continue that support Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dhyan. Uh, I'm yeah. running short of time. Okay. I, I hope I answered that question, Lara. Because yeah. I'm yes. terribly sorry, but there's something happened to my system and I'm not able to hear very, you know, clearly. No, I, I, I am. Thank you so much. I think yeah. you kind of also okay. uh, responded to the other speakers. Uh, I just want to ask uh, Anandita, my colleague, to uh, put forth one or two questions to the panel, um, critical questions. So I think we have time for two, three questions. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do quickly. Um, we have Dr. Suresh Chandra Dalai, who is the um, mission director for the Orissa Urban Housing Mission. Sir, are you still there? You want to ask your question directly to the panel? Sir, you are on mute. Okay, uh, let me ask on his behalf, he had uh, written it quite some time back on the chat. Um, so one of the questions that Dr. Dalai was asking is that, what do you think the applicability, you know, a state like Orissa, which has very low urbanization and uh, but significant renting going on in city specific, he's saying in model two ARHC in India, whether it's viable in small city or towns, because the migrant workers may not be able to afford the rent fixed by the private entity. So anyone who would like to take I that. can I can attempt uh, to answer this because I have done this extensively in Vizag and about 50 kilometers away from Vizag, sure. uh, which is which is which is uh, almost like uh, out of nowhere. You know, uh, mostly fishermen and all of those people live there. The two things I just want to also comment on one more thing before I go on to the answer. One is, uh, you know, we have done this uh, very unique concept of partnering with Akshay Patra, where we have created this kitchen with Akshay Patra, and uh, they uh, provide meals to um, all over 22,000 women who work in the Brandix factory. And that has really worked us very well. So I think that is something a service provider who is looking at massive numbers uh, can look at it because they do a fabulous job of automation. Coming uh, back to this, so, you know, uh, if you are at the outskirts of the outskirts and where the land cost is very low uh, and also the existing inventory is very low, it actually helps because uh, with the low uh, existing inventory, suddenly when there is a large manufacturing or a large industrial product which comes up, uh, you would see the rentals per square feet may be higher than some of the Bombay suburbs. And uh, also there is not enough capital or, or enough ways and means like water, electricity and all for uh, the competition in terms of unorganized sector to come over the period of three, four, five years. It does catch up, but it takes time. So in those areas, uh, these type of purpose-built uh, housing really helps because um, in the night there are power cards, there is no social ecosystem. People seek security much more than what they seek in an urban area. And plus, when there is some sort of uh, challenges in terms of heavy rains or you get cut off, uh, the, these massive community living helps. So I think uh, uh, in, in uh, this, uh, it will be sort of a reverse model here where this affordable house uh, accommodation will actually start picking up in uh, remote or small industrial towns rather than established clusters because availability of land will be less. And uh, I see a large clusters coming up in Sri City, coming up in Tirapur, coming up in some of those areas where the land price is low and uh, the numbers are very, very high. So I'm very positive about uh, states like Odisha, states like Andhra, 
where where we have this large in manufacturing industry coming up gujarat is a very good example where you know cities like dholera and all may get a lot of uh, you know organized uh, living centers thanks uh, thanks vishal that was very useful uh, there is one more question here which says is there a possibility of using zoning instruments to create fars and integrate this lack of land in cities with the spatial planning regime so that more land is released for affordable rental housing anyone would like to take that i think it is already provided for if you see the gujarat um, affordable housing policy document sorry hmm. affordable rental housing complex policy document it categorically says how much is the additional fsi free hmm. cost and land typology wise agricultural land also they have included industrial land residential land category 1 2 and commercial land they have given for each category what is the current fsi what is the additional free of cost fsi again it is a document now whether it is already being implemented that is a, you know like uh, rajesh calls it elephant in the room yes it is an elephant in the room but it is on paper available yes the answer is yes it is being used to incentivize thanks uh, thank you vijay uh, dhyan i'll end this question with you vishal though there is another question for you which says uh, are we imagining the b2b model as hostels for single people only is uh, what uh, you can start because that really got around uh, yeah could you repeat that question anindita no, then for you the question is have you got any loans from financial institutions such as hadco hdfc for rental housing what kind of financial incentives do you need for private rental so okay I'll, uh, Dian, to answer the first part of the question yes uh, we did get support from hdfc uh but what kind of financial support i think see there is a lot of thing which impact cost okay now i think uh, mr vijay mentioned that in the policy they talk about uh, utility cost being treated at residential level not at commercial level but currently wherever we operate we all pay commercial utility mm-hmm. rates especially electricity and water yes okay uh, then there is this other issue of property tax currently uh, in bangalore hostels have a kind of an in between tax it's neither commercial nor residential it's a sl- slightly higher rate than residential which is better than you know some of the uh, other cities and uh, what uh, you know uh, the flip side is it's actually leading to a lot of leakage because the informal sector is one of the largest players okay i mean compared to the formal sector i mean they're huge the informal sector and therefore as a result you do not have registered leases you do not have you know so they are not even being declared as operation operational as either hostels or uh, yeah. you know co living whatever you want to call them you know mm. so that's a huge leakage which i think the government should address and I, mm. i'm hoping that because once even though the policy mentions it it is eventually up to the states to kind of you know uh, talk about it the other thing is you know like for example in maharashtra you uh, you know one of the things that could actually safeguard the tenant in this case is say a long lease hmm. now what happens what's your stamp duty that adds a significant cost to your cost of operation yes now in maharashtra if i look at you know registering anything beyond a 5 year lease you know it, it will fix me for the rest of my life you know it's that bad True. whereas in some of the other states it's probably a little more reasonable but i think you know one should consider that because you want to operate within a legal framework and you make it extremely unviable for you to operate within that legal frame legal framework true very true thank you so much dan that yeah. is you okay. thank you and thank you anandita for uh, asking the panel the questions and uh, that brings us to the end of the panel um my heartfelt gratitude and thank you to all my panelists and uh, i've enjoyed interacting with you over the few, uh, last few days and um, i hope i can uh, come back to you when habitat for humanity and the entire core group of uh, uh, center for policy research giz ifc hatco um and um, others uh, who are working with us uh, can really build something together for uh, addressing 
uh, the housing uh, issues at, at the bottom of the pyramid for the EWS section in India. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to ask my colleague, uh, Anna Claudia, to uh, give the closing remarks to this uh, policy lab tree. Thank you so Thank much, you. everyone. Thank you, Dara. Thank you, Lara, uh, Rajan, um, panelists. This was a great panel. I was taking many notes. I think you will have a wonderful report from, from this lab. Many learnings uh, from, from my side. Uh, just quickly, I'm Anna Claudia Rosba. I'm the regional manager for Cities Alliance based in, in Latin America. So I'm here very early in the morning listening to you and, and, and learning about um, the challenges in India and South Africa, also in France. Uh, I think the overall picture uh, shows that um, we do have major challenges, uh, both in uh, developed countries and, um, well, global South countries like India and South Africa in terms of land. Land is critical. So France um, unlocks, um, finds, has incentives to unlock private land through tax incentives, something that we have less here in, in the Global South. Sao Paulo has an experience in the previous lab, we presented that uh, taxation of, uh, very new though, uh, taxation of uh, private land, um, underutilized or vacant. Um, but this is an alternative uh, that we are not looking at in both uh, countries, India and, and South Africa. Although there is a great availability of public land in India. Uh, even though with many challenges uh, to be addressed. No, unlocking public land is not as easy. Uh, experiences in Latin America show that in Africa as well. So it's also considered an economic asset uh, for the state. So it's difficult to transfer to companies, to the private owners, to social housing, etc. But anyway, there's a huge potential there. And I think the business model presented by South Africa um, indicates some interesting innovation uh, while supporting small uh, and medium-sized entrepreneurs, it also helps to increase the local knowledge and to leverage the smaller uh, pockets of land. You know? um, and also uh, understanding the, the, the advantages of densification. You know? I took note of Paul's, um, Paul's uh, mention of uh, the, the positive fiscal impacts of densification. And I think he was talking also about, you know, uh, not large scale like we think uh, in Brazil and India, but, you know, small, you know, densification uh, pockets. So this is an alternative of, 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 of business model for, for countries in the South. I understand it has a, a long trajectory, uh, but it now achieved a momentum, right? And like all initiatives uh, being in India, uh, South Africa, France, the USA was mentioned, uh, public policy and the, and the legal frameworks is, is a must, you know? uh, So we have uh, sort of compounded this laboratory. So the first one was on, on policy framework, the second on public policy. Now this is a uh, market, private markets, but they are all interrelated because it clearly in any country, the, the market will not function without a, a clear, clear framework, policy framework, and, 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 and clarity on, on, on the legal framework. Uh, of course, uh, the, the French model is, is very sophisticated. It has different schemes, arrangements, subsidies. It's, it's fiscally, it's very heavy. Uh, financial alternatives. Um, also, I'm sure uh, Claude didn't mention, but uh, people were talking at the end about uh, city planning. And, and this is a strength in, in, in French cities, right? So this shows an overall system that ecosystem that has been developed for many, many years. Uh, and um, it, it has a high degree of sophistication. We are far away to get uh, to, to those systems, but I do believe uh, from what we heard in this last panel, that there is an appetite from the private sector in India. There's an appetite from the public sector in India. There is a social need, you no? Know? Uh, the three models presented, they demonstrated that uh, for the private markets, there's a social function. And, and the challenge now, right, that we have is how to connect this social function uh, and this uh, principle of co-responsibility of, of the private companies 
um, to you know sustainable uh, business models uh, that are profitable uh, also for 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 different size of companies. Uh, what I understood from this last panel is that um, uh, this current policy uh, might be uh, starting a process of leveraging an ecosystem for for rental housing in India, although there is uh, there is a culture gap, let's say so, there's also um, an appetite from, from, from the consumer side, right? There is a need, uh, demand uh, from, from the consumer side uh, to, to access more, more rental housing. Um, I see that there are many challenges though, um, in the case of India now. Uh, the robustness uh, of the current policy announcement has still to be proven, right? Um, the incentives, uh, the clarity of incentives uh, must be very, very uh, transparent uh, to all stakeholders. The land issue no, is still a, a big challenge as it is in, in, in all countries. Um, the funding challenges, uh, the example of the US now, I think it's very interesting. There's a small example here in, in, in Brazil of, of social bonus for, for, for this very, very innovative starting right now. Uh, but I think we have to look at this, uh, at this innovation as well uh, to our countries and also the challenge, the social challenges no? for, for the private sector to operate uh, because there are social needs and they will not be solved with the houses. So they continue and um, this, this clients, um, this beneficiaries, they will face um, economic challenges. They are facing permanently um, economic challenges. Um, there's in India the major gap of the legal framework, but the case of Tamil Nadu shows also an interesting trend. You know? So maybe the national gap can be covered through local um, uh, legal frameworks and, and more uh, local protagonism. So it's clear the last, uh, the last interventions demonstrated the importance of the local prota protagonism you know, in terms of uh, land planning, uh, uh, um, is stim stimulate and leverage the, the, no the local knowledge you know, uh, to expand the supply of land for, for, for affordable housing and, and, and for, and for uh, rental housing. Um, so um, overall, uh, I believe, uh, and there are also uh, many private sector companies from different sizes here. Overall, I understood that appetite is for, for big scale because we understand in our countries that the, the need is big and uh, business are also big, but there's also innovation in the business sector. And um, maybe the case of South Africa can bring also some, some light in terms of alternative of uh, business uh, development. And um, I understand also from the conversations that many more deep dives are needed, uh, but I appreciate your availability to be here with us today. We'll, we'll have one more policy love. This is a collaborative effort you see on the logos. I will not mention all the organizations involved because I might, it's too early for me and I might forget some of those, but uh, we do have development banks, NGOs, uh, research centers, um, international organizations, local organizations. So it's a, it's a collective effort to understand the dimension of, of, of the housing uh, um, needs and potential uh, in India and also what this policy needs, you know, offers um, to the overall society. In the last interventions uh, that Ravi was mentioned, so we need to have clear um, and have clarity about the, the, the dimensions of informality that we do have. Um, in all cases, uh, it was very clear that it's very hard to reach out to the poorest of the poor. So this remains as a big, big challenge uh, maybe uh, the rental policy will not be the solution uh, or the right response for, for these major needs, but clearly, clearly there is a niche and we have to evolve in this, in this co-creation. So thank you very much. Thank you for the co-organizers and congratulations, Habitat for Amenity, this was, and CPR <laughs> for always being there and present and co-organizing. This was an excellent event. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. You the next love. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining. Thank you all. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Rajesh. Thanks, Balaji. Thanks, Kian. Thank you, Rajan. Thanks. Thanks, bye everyone. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Vishal. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Kian. Bye-bye. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye, Anandita. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you, Claude. Thanks, Anandita. Bye. 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 Thanks, Yan. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dalai. Thank you. Thank you for joining.